Turn with me then to set my court going to Galatians chapter six. And we're going to look at verses seven through ten this morning. And I want to use verse eight as the subject of our sermon this morning, and I've titled it then So to the Spirit. It's a very appropriate analogy in a rural community. The young man who was preaching for us last week is a busy farmer. And when I asked him to come back and preach again, he told me, please, after the harvest. Because our world actually functions around the idea that we have to sow to harvest. We have to sow to reap. And Paul has taken this picture and he uses it quite effectually to add it to what he had said in chapter 5 about walking in the spirit being led by the spirit and those are challenges to us to live as spirit filled men and women there's a an important and slight change now it's one thing to follow and be led it's something further and helpful to understand that we have to plant. We have to make choices which will indeed be pleasing to God and be experienced in the fullness of the Spirit. One of the things I found when I was reading about sowing and planting is the farmer knows that what he plants is what he gets. He plants corn, he gets corn. He plants wheat, he gets wheat. But the thing I hadn't really noticed before was that he plants a single seed and he gets a whole bunch back. So that in the picture of sowing, there is potentially a great encouragement of blessing. You put one seed into your life and you reap an abundance of fruit. It does tie back also to the idea of the fruit of the Spirit. You will, in fact, harvest what you take time to put into your life. It's one thing to read about the fruit of the Spirit in chapter 5. But it won't happen unless you and I understand this principle that you reap what you sow. And the converse is also true. If you don't sow, you won't reap. And so the thing that stands out in this whole section is a call to understand our own part in seeing the fruit of the Spirit growing in our lives and in the life of Christ church. I've got three subheadings from the passage the first one is the danger of deception. The second one is dig for your life. The third one is dynamic church. They're here, as I'll seek to show you. Verse 7, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Do not be Deceived. Now it's striking that that's right at the beginning of this section. It tells me that as Paul talks to brethren, verse 1 and verse 18, there is a great danger for true believers to be deceived. It's true the enemy has deceived the unbelievers, but there's a great danger for Christians that if they ignore what God has done in Christ, they will indeed reap what they sow. It fits in with the context of verse 6. Two weeks ago, remember, I spoke to you about the fact that God provides leaders and teachers. And by implication, when Paul speaks in verse 7, what he's saying is you need to actually listen to the teachers that God sent you. You need to treasure what they are explaining to you and 
sow it into your life. So that it's not simply something which is experienced for an hour or so on a Sunday morning. But that it becomes something which is in your thinking, in your choosing, in your deciding through the rest of the week. I have a book by a man called Jay Adams and it's called What to Do on Thursday. And the whole premise of the book is that by Thursday you should be putting into practice what you heard on Sunday. And surely there's a great challenge for us here as we read this. That we should not be deceived by those who imagine that they know the truth and can lead us into greater light or greater truth. And history shows quite clearly that Christians are always vulnerable to false teachers. That's why there are so many different Christian groups and ministries and denominations. Somebody somewhere has got it wrong. They can't all be right. And it becomes us then as Christians to make it our business not to be deceived. And that means you need to be familiar with God's word. To know those points of which choices are free to be made. And to know those points of which there is only one way forward. Behind this whole book is the issue of the gospel. Remember chapter 1, people had come and they were preaching another gospel. It looked like what God had revealed. But it in fact was a, a, a misleading gospel. Which would result in men and women losing the knowledge of God. And it's surely even more poignant and important today when we live in a day when everybody's right. And today we fight passionately for our freedom to think what we think and not be controlled by other people. Now there's no sense in which a church should be controlled by its leaders, but they should be controlled by Christ. And be led by Christ in what to do. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. The only fool when you're deceived is you. And that's what Paul's saying to these Galatians. But we seem to have reverted to times when people... Snub their nose at God. I was listening to an article on the radio just the other day about these ladies that are complaining that in their mind God is always portrayed as a white male. And I thought, who would do that to God? God has no shape or form. He's a spirit. But they pick up on an idea and they run with it because it's the, it, it's the spirit of the age that we're in. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Proverbs 26, 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. You've met know-it-alls, haven't you? There is more hope for a fool. And biblically a fool is someone who says there is no God. Than for him. 2 Timothy 4. For the time will come when there will, they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears. They will keep up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. And be turned aside to fables. Fables like Scientology. The Martians visited this planet and initiated life. And they left something behind. I think they're called Thetans. And now what men and women need to do is to experience the Thetan in themselves so that they can be released back into the universe. Incredible, isn't it? Yet, it's a very rich and worldwide organization. 
claiming to come under the Christian umbrella. Paul wants you and me to wrestle with this responsibility of not being deceived. There is a way that seems right to a man. Can he finish it? But the end thereof is destruction. Always concerned me that Solomon took time to write that twice in the book of Proverbs. Do not be deceived. So you have a command here to be wary of that which is appealing to the flesh, that which is attractive to your emotions. Because nobody sets out to go astray. Millions have though. And across the history of Christianity, I won't name any part of it because there's always problems wherever you go. Across the history of Christianity, there have been so many diversions from the simple plain gospel that Christ died for sinners and those who believe in him are saved through him for everlasting life. This verse brings home this urgent responsibility that as Christians, you and I are called to be serious minded about the things of God, to, to make it our business, to make sure we have somebody who can explain the gospel to us if we don't understand it and that they are faithful to God's word. Because God doesn't change. He's not one thing today and another thing tomorrow. Psalm 105 verse 8. He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. Or Isaiah 40 and 8. The grass wither, the flower fades. But the word of God stands forever. Do not be deceived. One version translates the part. God is not mocked. As don't thumb your nose at God. Because in effect, that's what you do when you, you say, I know what the gospel says, but we need to add this or subtract that. And as I read this, you see, it brought home to me this great challenge of how I'm living my Christian life. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. It's quite a thought, isn't it? I'm sure there are other people and other things that impact your life and mine and affect who we are. But ultimately, who you are is who you choose to be. What you put in your life is what is seen in your life. And it's fabulous that God uses such a simple picture. Everybody's grown plants from seeds. We know how it happens. Around now you'll be maybe sowing tomato seeds in the hope of a harvest in the autumn time. Or you've put flowers in the garden. Did you see those bluebells outside this morning? What a stunning show of colour. They didn't just happen to pop in by themselves. Somebody planted a seed somewhere. Somebody transferred the plants. And now we have... The pleasure that comes from them. Dear Christian, it's vital to understand that every believer is called upon to not be deceived. Every believer is called upon to take God seriously and to make sure that what's going on in their life is what he wants to go on. And then it's not just the individual believer. It's the calling of every local church. That it's our business to make sure as a congregation that we adhere to what God says. And that we promote what God says in the world around us. And that that sowing is to be the passion of our life. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say... He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I know the context there is giving, but it's a principle surely from this verse which applies to the whole of our Christian life. 
Dear friends, it's vitally important that you weigh up who you're listening to, including this man. And you're able to disagree when necessary. And to explain why you disagree, because you've been reading God's word. No one is neutral. Not even their preachers. And we live in a day and age when we've now been swamped by would-be preachers. Even on normal television, you have so-called Christian television channels promoting major error. And there are Christians who think it's wonderful. My dear, dear friends, let's be aware that you reap what you sow. Take stock. Who gets most of your attention during the week? Are you reading Christian books? Are you studying the Bible on your own? Are there themes from the Bible that you're interested in and are exploring? Too often Christianity has become a passive. I believe because he told me, she told me. It's personal. Do not be deceived. What you sow is what you reap. When Martin Luther gave the eulogy at the funeral of a pastor in Zico in 22, he says, what we preach, he lived. And that surely is the call on all our lives. And to the unbeliever, I need to challenge who you're listening to. The widest umbrella is the lie of secularism. That there is no God, and if there is, you're his master. There is one true God. We know it with absolute certainty because Jesus came here to reveal him. And we know that he's holy, and therefore you and I need to be made holy. And that's only possible because Jesus died for us and rose again the third day. I came across an illustration. I usually go looking for them on a Saturday night. And this one intrigued me because a member of our congregation has the same name as him. Michael Joseph Farrell. You probably know him better as B.J. Honeycutt from the television series MASH. He gave his reason for why he didn't give in to temptation in the midst of the Korean War as this. I live in an insane world where nothing makes sense. Everyone around me lives for the now because there may not be tomorrow. But I have to live for tomorrow because for me there is no now. For BJ, his hope for the future was seeing his family again. And that hope was sufficient to control how he lived. One day, you see, friends, we all have to stop living. And on that day, will you have a hope which is realized. So we need to watch and not be deceived. We need to dig for our life. My uh, alliteration got me into a wee bit of trouble here. It was as close as I could find a letter D to explain what I want to say next. We need to dig for our life. We need to choose to walk in the Spirit. We need to choose to be led by the Spirit. And we need to plant what the Spirit is putting into our lives so that it will grow. Every Christian life is bearing fruit. And that fruit is directly determined by what you're fertilized with, if I try and stick to the analogy. What you weather, whether you get the sunshine of God's love 
And the, 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 the purpose of the apostle here seems to be to, to cultivate in these people's life a desire for that fruit expressed back in chapter 5, 22 and 23 and known as the fruit, the single fruit of the Spirit. Look at verse 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap destruction. That should take you back to verse 17 of verse of chapter 5, where we have the list of what the flesh does. He who makes that their priority in life, she who lives for those kind of things, is actually revealing that they've never been born again. And they're on the road to destruction. But the converse is here, isn't it? But he who sows to the Spirit... That's a lovely phrase. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Paul is quite clear with these Galatians right from chapter 1 that they are making choices. And that the choices they are making determine the kind of person they become. The idea is quite clear, you see. It, it's actually expressed in such a way that there doesn't seem to be a middle ground. You're either planting to destruction or you're planting to the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit. And each choice produces its own fruit. Some of it is only weeds. Others, though, are to the glory of God. But please notice again, there's no middle ground. There's no fallow land here that just lies barren. And truth be told, if you find a piece of fallow land that's barren, it's actually got things growing in it, hasn't it? What are they called? Weeds. When the Lord spoke to Hosea, to Israel through the prophet Hosea, chapter 10, he said, Sow for yourself righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity, you have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of mighty men. Notice that, in your own way. When people line up behind Eve and decide that they're independent and that they can improve on what God has created, tragedy follows. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. These are obviously two quite different Results. There's a challenge all the way through the book as to whether you're just religious or whether you're righteous in Christ. And one of the marks of the religious people is that they love the external. For them, it's all about seeing, smelling, doing. Remember the two ladies who left us because we weren't active enough during the service? That's the world I live in. And that's the reason that gospel churches are being neglected. People are going to follow after what they enjoy. The kind of music they like. The short, funny sermons that sends them home with a smile. Rather than the faithful worship of God through the preaching of his word. And the sobering reality is to remember then. That when we sow to the flesh, we reap more than we sow. There's a sense in which it will almost take over. And that's well illustrated in the fall of Adam and Eve. One couple sinned and the whole world was ruined. 
do you think that your life will be any different? Think back to King David, God's chosen king. And what a special place he had one sin. And the whole of his life on this earth was ruined. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? 2 Samuel 12. You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore, you see, that's the sowing. Here's the reaping. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This is one of God's saints in the Old Testament. A man who's spoken of so highly. But he reaped what he sowed. And dear Christian, that surely should be challenging to all of us. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You need to just be careful there. He's not suggesting we earn everlasting life. He, he's indicating that what's going on is that when a man or woman's heart is set on following what the Spirit teaches them through the Word, that shows that they have everlasting life, and that will be their final outcome. But it does point to us, point out to us that true believers are spiritually alive. They're daily walking in the Spirit. They're daily being led by the Spirit. They are day and daily praying to be filled with the Spirit. And they are putting things into their life which the Spirit gives them from the Word and from which they want their life to develop and grow. Dearly beloved, you and I are children of God by His grace. Chapter 4 and verse 6, he said these words to them. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. He's talking to people who are real Christians, but he's warning them, you see, that even Christians are going to, are going to get the full effect of what they pursue. And that the Christian is therefore called on to recognize the negativity of the flesh and to pursue the things of the spirit. Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Colossians 3, 1, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of earth. Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to, to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, God, these are sons of God. It's a distinguishing characteristic and mark of a child of God. It won't be perfect, but it will be their priority. And they will choose to have God's word living in their life. And so we have to dig for our lives. I was thinking about what happened, was it during the Second World War or just after it, where everybody was encouraged to plant vegetables, weren't they? They were encouraged to, to cultivate their gardens, not flowers, but food. And I, I, I thought that's a, a good place for us to, to grasp the image. What is taking up my time? What is filling my mind? What are my goals and aims and ambitions? We are faced day and daily with decisions that determine our destiny. We are not just victims of circumstances. I've told you about Harry Hill before when I worked in the power station in the engineering department when you wanted something made on the lathe 
you had to go and talk to Harry. Harry was the 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 lathe operator. But as long as you were in Harry's presence, you just got a long list of negativity. He had something bad to say about everybody. And he would complain that it was other people that made him how he was. Christian, you and I need to recognize from this verse that who you are is who you're choosing to be. And that if you're ever going to be anything significant for God, you need to choose to follow Christ. Are you familiar with that uh, secular saying, so a thought, reap an act. So an act, reap a habit. So a habit, reek, reap a character. So a character and reap a destiny. If the world can recognize this principle, then you and I surely have the grace to recognize it. So I ask you, as I ask myself when I study these things, what's growing in my life? Who put it there? You see it in the garden. I'm glad to say I've handed all over all the gardening except cutting the grass to my wife. But she plants seeds. And you know that whatever it says on the seed label is what's going to come up. And apply it then, says Paul, to your Christian life. The things that are taking up the other 167 hours of your week are growing things in your life. Then for the unbeliever, he always needs to be brought back. As I drove to Scotland last Monday, there was one part of the road where it was like a sea of white on the verge. And what was it? It was dandelions and they were all getting to the point of beginning to spread their seeds. And then lo and behold, I read an article on dandelions extolling the benefits. Do you, know, do you know that dandelions in your lawn can tell you the health of your lawn? And that they actually have a, a, a helpful aspect to them where they make your lawn healthier by feeding back in certain chemicals. And apparently, if your dandelion leaves are lying flat and insipid, then your lawn's in a bad condition. And as your lawn improves, the dandelion leaves will begin to stand up. It's interesting. Or at least I found it interesting. But can I say to you as a non-believer, you see, what you're planting in your life if you're just living to be comfortable, if you're just living to be happy, if you're just living to, to, to be rich or, or, or whatever it is, fat, thin, tall, short, muscles or without muscles, then one day it all switches off. Again, being up in Edinburgh, I became very aware that I'm living in a Christian bubble. One of the problems of a minister's job, you don't mix with unbelievers as much as other people do. And I suddenly became aware, even through meeting family, how, how different their whole worldview is. They're sowing to the flesh. And as long as that continues, then they're heading for destruction. My last point needs to be put in here. Because Paul has a progress here. Don't be deceived. Sow to the Spirit. And then verse 9 and 10, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. This tells me that when I'm sowing to the Spirit, one of the immediate effects of it will be that I will be like my Lord Jesus in that we will serve rather than wait to be served. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. 
And if you do remember, when I spoke on this fruit of the Spirit, I suggested to you that it is and always will be a picture of who Jesus is. Those nine parts are actually a perfect insight into who Christ is. And therefore, as we sow to the Spirit and develop and grow the fruit of the Spirit, what will be happening, we will become more Christ-like. And being more Christ-like, we will not simply be here to see what we can get out of things. We will be here to see how we can help spread the love of God abroad in the world. That's God's plan. And that's the very thing the enemy strikes at. That's the deception, you see. We get into our theological corners and we raise our flags and say, don't you dare come near me. The Holy God calls us to a life of service. Christians should be queuing up to see what they can do. Where do I get such ideas? Go back to verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good. We've been in this building over five, over five years now, I think. And it would be quite easy to grow weary in doing the good that we're doing. And yet, our problem is, we have to fit in with God's timetable. He is not going to fit in with ours. And while you and I might not see what we would like to see, God is still actively at work. And in due time, we shall reap if we do not get weary. And so this verse is a real stir to the heart and mind about our whole life as Christians. Let us not grow weary while doing good. I wrestled a bit with this idea of good. What does he mean by doing good? Well, if you put it back in the context, verses 1 through 6 describe being helpful and serving your brothers and sisters as Christians. So doing good is first and foremost, especially to the household of faith. Verse 10. It's looking for ways to make the work of God's people possible. Asking yourself, what gifts of the Spirit have I been given? And where's that opportunity to use them? So that the, the work of God would grow and prosper. Because life is not a sprint, it's a marathon race. And if you know anything about marathons, again, the radio is a terrible thing than you used this morning. 26 people were killed in China while they were on a marathon. They've gone to some remote, dangerous place and it become so cold they expired. I don't know why I told you that. But anyway, life is a marathon. One that you've got to bend down and, and get yourself engaged in. And that's God's purpose for your life. To do the good of seeing his church established furnished and functioning. And there is a place for each one of us. And just to go back two weeks when we call a new minister, we will need to, to, to embrace the things which allows him to get on with that work. It's not somebody else's job, it's yours and mine. One writer said, Sowing to please the Spirit means serving one another in love. Chapter 5, verse 13. Through love, serve one another. But that word good has a, has a wider meaning because you notice here, let us not grow weary. Let me jump to verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. This really is an exhortation to be an evangelist. Not everybody can stand in the marketplace, but every Christian can pray. And therefore it becomes our work, not just his or her hobby or, or interest. 
Because the greatest good you can do for any human being is to bring them to meet the Saviour. Again, this week up in Edinburgh, uh, visiting ageing family, you become very aware of how life can become absolutely futile and meaningless. And that should not be the case for a Christian. No matter how young or old you are, God has a, a, a plan for your life. God has a place for you to serve him. God has a purpose in your being here. And what that purpose is, is to take the gospel to the world. Earlier on in chapter 3, he, he, he says these words. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. It's our function as a church. To be those who are taking that blessing to the nations. It's our function as a church. To be dedicated to growing fruit. Of the spirit in our own lives. And in the life of a Christian community. Believing that God's taking care of us. Nurturing us. Developing us through our hardships as well as our joys. And then to bring it home to the unbelievers. Can I ask who's taking care of you? All the care institutions, I think almost all of them in our present day, came about because Christians cared. The very hospitals that we depend on. Come back from the days when Christians cared for the sick and the needy. When the pagans had no time for them. The modern pressure towards euthanasia. Shows that we are turning back into a pagan mentality. You're only good if you're, life, if you're alive and can function. I dread to think what's happening in parts of our world. And then I read... That the first direct order from euthanasia in Nazi Germany came from Hitler. In 1939 it said all state institutions were required to report on patients who had been ill for five years or more or who were unable to work. The decision regarding which patient should be killed was made entirely on the basis of name, race, marital status, status nationality, next of kin regularly visited by whom in the statement of financial responsibility. Can you see that mentality today? It's growing. Who's going to resist it? God's people. We need to stand up to do good. Do listen in to the Christian Institute on Thursday. It's essential that we have that kind of information. So that we can draw our line in the sand and we can say for God's glory that we are not being deceived. We are not being fooled by fairy tales. We are the people of the living risen Savior who indwells us by his spirit. And is clearly not finished growing for his glory because we're still here. Amen. The closing hymn is 334. Father of everlasting grace, your goodness and your truth we praise. Your goodness and your truth we prove. You have, in honor of your Son, the gift unspeakable sent down, the spirit of life and power and love. 334.
Thank you for the word of God as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, the guide to keep us from being deceived. Help us, Lord, to reevaluate, reassess, and realign ourselves with what it means to sow to the Spirit, that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and be a living, gracious testimony to his loving kindness to all and sundry. In Jesus' name, amen.